Hello everyone and welcome back to Abundantly Minimal. My name is Sarah and today we have a Q&A video with questions you guys submitted on my recent community post here on YouTube and I will leave uh, the timestamps below so if you feel like jumping around or skipping any questions you can do that and there will be a bit of a life update woven in uh, which kind of aligns with some of the questions as well. So let's jump right into it. The first question comes from Rachel. Would you be willing to share your journey on paying off your home? So uh, something we are very excited to report is that we did officially pay off our home at the end of 2021. Now, uh, if you have been here for a while, you know that that was one of our goals was to pay our home off early. Uh, in 2018, at the end of the year, we purchased a $161,000 condo, two bedroom, uh, 1400 square foot condo. During the first four and a half years of our marriage, we were renting and saving up money, very much living a frugal lifestyle. So we were able to actually put 50% down when we purchased the home. And our goal was, you know, paying it very quickly. Now I had the very, I want to say extreme goal, but if I had really crunched the numbers, this was an extreme goal. My initial hope was to pay it off in two years, um, but life changed a lot during that time. I ended up leaving my teaching job to focus on my businesses full time. And then actually, you know, as of this school year, Jake has joined me as well full time. So there was a lot of ebbs and flows, I guess, along the journey. But uh, very fortunately, uh, this starting this school year, um, a new cycle, I guess, of, of the uh, teacher business that we run, Mr. and Mrs. Social Studies, we continued to see immense growth. And part of that growth meant that we were able to pay off the remaining $20,000 balance within a few months. So that was very exciting. Now, of course, every time I mention house stuff, I always get comments, people saying that I shouldn't have you know, paid off my house, I should have done X, Y, and Z, instead or just talking about the differences and you know to that i always want to say it's all trade-offs everyone is making their own choices with different circumstances and i know for me there is a great sense of freedom and peace of mind to now not have a mortgage especially since my businesses are supporting our family 100 percent and in case those ever slow down or something changes, I love knowing that nothing would happen, you know, from a housing perspective, we'd be covered. We took care of our biggest expense that happened each month and it's gone now. And so I think that's been a big relief uh, for sure. And having that taken care of, it definitely is an interesting point for us to reflect about what our updated financial goals are. We have always been contributing to retirement funds and investing, and we will likely continue to bolster our emergency fund. We did buy a condo, and eventually at some day we would like to have, I call it a house house, a home that's actually a house, a freestanding home. Uh, so we may start a fund for that, we'll see, uh, but that's kind of the general update there. Next question came from Faye and it's, are there any movies, shows, book series, or other media that you're into? And I think this one definitely uh, can, can go a bunch of different ways. I know for something Jake and I have gotten into or back into, uh, we were fans of watching the show, The Amazing Race Together. It's where people travel around the globe and complete different challenges. And uh, we decided we were gonna go back and watch some of the very first seasons. It started out, I just wanted to see one episode just to see how different it was, um, you know, just how people were traveling 20 years ago. I watched these when I was a kid. They came out when I was maybe fourth, fifth grade. Um, but from an adult perspective and just also seeing how the world has changed has been fascinating and we've had a lot of fun. So we're not planning to watch all, you know, 30 seasons or anything, but we are picking and choosing some seasons to watch back, uh, which has been very fun. In terms of reading, I don't really read books for pleasure at the moment. Not that I have anything against it. It's just I've still been really busy. So if I am reading, it's for work purposes. Um, and that's fine to me. I do think at some point I'll get back into like reading fiction and, and that kind of thing. Um, and then as far as movies, uh, Jake has turned me into a bit of a Marvel <laughs> junkie. So we did uh, go to the movie theater a couple weeks ago and we saw the new Spider-Man movie. Um, it's really fun. Our theater on Tuesdays, they do a $5 movie deal all day. So uh, we both got to go to the movies, reclining chairs, 10 bucks. So it was a, a very fun little mid-afternoon date uh, that we enjoyed. 
And then as far as um, other media is concerned, we I feel like overall I'm watching less YouTube and generally consuming less media than I was in the past. Um, but I'm a big music fan, so I'll be listening to music while I work, you know, pretty much all day. So it just kind of uh, depends there. Um, generally pop music, but it can be, you know, quite a quite a range. Um, so that would be my, I guess, hopefully a <laughs> good answer for for that question. The next question here, a little bit more of a serious question. This came from Tori and she said, my mom who lived with my husband and I passed away about a year ago. I've been trying to keep up with the house, dishes, cleaning flat services, vacuuming while still grieving. And I feel like I'm barely keeping my head above water. But the problem comes in when I get to my mom's master bedroom, bathroom and closet. It has turned into a disaster. I don't know how to start plus still keep the rest of the house tidy. So first of all, Tori, I'm so sorry to hear about uh, the passing of your mom. And it, you've definitely raised a very you know, challenging situation here that I'm, I'm sure many others can relate to in the sense that how do you balance not only grieving for the loss of a loved one, but also handling their, that influx of belongings and items that you know need to be dealt with while finding balance within you know, quite frankly, tasks that are challenging enough in your own personal life and keeping that going. So I would say my first uh, suggestion would be to see if you can reach out for help. Uh, I know that in many families or um, in different situations I've seen, it often, to me at least, my perception seems that women often take on uh, a very large role and maybe an unequal role, like too much of a role of responsibilities. And, you know, basically the, I can do it all, you know, attitude, or like, I'm going to, you know, I just have to take care of these. Um, and I know for me, that's been definitely something I have to kind of check those feelings when I have the feelings like I must do everything and ask for help. I'm not sure how these tasks are divided in your own household, but I would encourage you to ask your husband uh, if maybe there's some other things that he can do to step up, as well as um, in this particular situation, I think it might be helpful to try to visualize a big timeline for yourself. What long-term timeline would you like to have for this particular project? It might feel like there's a lot of urgency, like, oh, these tasks need to all happen, but the grieving itself is going to take time. And I don't want you to feel like you have to rush through the grieving process or ignore um, your feelings to be able to try to accomplish, you know, or to go through these items. So I would say be gentle with yourself and think about, okay, what would be a really healthy, manageable timeline to go through this? Honestly, if you're not super cramped for space, maybe you can even have this be like a three-year timeline or you know a five-year timeline and think about how you can break up those smaller pieces. Maybe you set a monthly goal for yourself of a small selection of items you want to try to work through. The other thing that I know I've told my course students um, a variety of times is that even though a person was very significant to us, it doesn't mean that all of their belongings are significant. And we can sometimes create little stories about things that encourages us to hold on to items. But I like to think about it from the perspective of a museum. In a museum, they're not displaying every artifact that they ever have had about a certain topic because that would be completely overwhelming. Instead, they're showcasing the best, most important, most significant pieces and prioritizing those, maybe giving them a nice display, a prominent place, you know. And the other items maybe are just kept in the back somewhere or dealt with. And so perhaps it'd be helpful to think about that same approach here. What were those pieces that you have or those belongings that were most impactful to your mom and that you want to celebrate and want to preserve above certain other things. And when we identify that, we can still, you know, tell the legacy of this person or show the legacy of this person, but in a positive way that emphasizes the more important parts. So I encourage you to be gracious to yourself. Give yourself plenty of time. There's no race here. There's no speed at which someone should or, you know, should not handle this grief. You just need to know that you're on your own path and ask for help if you can and maybe set, you know, very small bite-sized goals. 
So again, I, I'm so sorry for your loss and I hope that some of these uh, words or ideas may, may be helpful. The next question came from Gemma. She said, hi, Sarah. I hope you, Jake and Droopy are well. This might sound like a weird question, but what is your favorite room in your house and why? Also, how do you ensure you keep your home looking fresh and not the same? Do you regularly move furniture or decor to mix things up? Before I get to Gemma's question, I do want to briefly address uh, Droopy, who um, maybe you had, I mentioned him in a couple videos. Uh, in late December, we went ahead and adopted a rabbit. And uh, it was something we had researched for a long time. Uh, we had been looking at listings for a long time as well. We had kind of a very specific thing that we were looking for in terms of behaviors and, and that sort of thing. But unfortunately, it ended up not working out. Um, and <laughs> I'll probably be very wordy about this just because um, we ended up having him total for about five weeks. And um, it was honestly a conversation topic of like, what is our future even going to look like almost every day um, with it? It was definitely um, much more difficult than I uh, had anticipated. And um, I hate that, you know, we ended up making the choice that we did in terms of, you know, uprooting him and um, not being able, I just, I really did not expect that it wouldn't work. Um, so it's very disappointing that that was the outcome that ended up happening, but it also really ended up being much more of a nightmare than um, I think either of us, either Jake or I had anticipated. Um, we, <laughs> gosh, where to even begin? Um, we ended up having him and like under the idea that we were planning to keep him for about three weeks until we then had to, we realized enough was enough and, and we did need to um, send in a notice to the shelter that we didn't think it was gonna work out and that they could put him back up, like his listing back up for adoption. And two weeks later then there was a girl who reached out who was interested in fostering him. And so from there we, um, we, we brought him to her. It definitely, when I had filmed a couple of those videos where I mentioned it, I think that was probably still in the honeymoon phase. Things weren't good, but I assumed that they were gonna get better um, just because, you know, you have to give an animal time when they're adjusting. But <laughs> I think neither Jake or I was prepared for the, basically putting your life on hold for, for an animal. Um, he was a really big chewer. Um, we had uh, specifically been looking for rabbits who were not. Now, you know, that's partially shame on us because rabbits do tend to just chew. They, I'm not sure what percentage do, um, and especially younger rabbits, I think, tend to chew more. And so that ultimately was one of the biggest challenges we had gone to pretty substantial lengths to bunny proof our home, or at least the area where he was going to be, which was our main area. But <laughs> he chewed both things that were expected for him to chew, but also things that weren't expected. So he chewed the couch, coffee table, we had to switch out, plastic blinds, these yoga mats we had out, our pants while we were wearing them, just coming over and, and you know, taking a bite. Corners of the room, walls, kitchen cabinets. He even, this wasn't necessarily a chewing thing, but on one of the last days that we had him, he picked up a vent cover off and then was ready to go into the vent on the floor. And it's like, how do you even do that? You're just a little, a little rabbit. So he was definitely a very curious guy and I know I'm missing things. We have bite marks all around our house just from the short time he was with us. So that was definitely stressful. Whenever he was free roam, we felt like we couldn't relax and we even structured our time so someone was watching him at all times. And that was something I, I knew like whenever I'm a parent, you know, like when you have a toddler, like I'm fully prepared, like that's what you do, like putting a bunch of other things on hold uh, to make sure, you know, that doesn't happen or that nothing bad happens. And I don't think at this stage of life, I was ready to sacrifice all of that. Like we weren't able to like work together in the same room anymore because someone needed to be with him watching him. 
And of course, you know, through we sent some emails back and forth with the adoption agency trying to problem solve and troubleshoot. And so they did say that we could just keep him in his pen more of the day. We had a nice, this was a very, this was like luxury rabbit accommodations, but he had a 32 square foot um, pen in our living room, uh, which also destroyed the <laughs> aesthetic of the living room. But um, we just, we hated like the idea of leaving him in there all day. Ideally, you know, rabbits are supposed to have more free roam time. So it basically turned into a situation where we only, like at least for me, I only felt like at peace when he was in his pen because I wasn't afraid that he was getting into something. And um, I mean, he was hardcore, like even uh, because of areas he was trying to get to, we were putting up like these dumbbell weights just to block them off or we had to put them on top of the vents once he discovered he could lift up the vents and try to get into, you know, <laughs> the air ducts or whatever. But he even after uh, we had passed him to the, to the next foster, um, he, we found on weights, like metal weights, he had ripped out chunks somehow of them. So it was definitely, I think, very challenging um, in that way. I know there was some selfishness as well, uh, specifically on my behalf, where just feeling like, you know, part of minimalism is creating this home that you love and making these different adjustments that you love and, you know, finding a lot of peace in your space. And again, maybe we went too hardcore. We, um, between bunny proofing and switching out furniture and even just the different things we were adding to the space to try to encourage him to chew on that or to give enrichment. Not only was it very expensive, we spent over $300 just on like toys and chewing mechanisms and, and things to prevent him from chewing things he wasn't supposed to. But also it's like when my mom walked in to visit one time, she said, this doesn't look like your home anymore. This is a bunny playground. And honestly, it pretty much was. So I think that was definitely a big factor. In the first uh, few weeks, I had several breakdowns, which honestly, I feel like I handle stress generally very well. Um, the last time I had some of these style breakdowns was actually while I was still in college and working two jobs uh, while taking like a full course load, just the, the stress of it. And I went there again uh, several times and it was multiple breakdowns, but then saying, no, we can do this. Like we can make this work. Let's do this. Well, these will be the action steps. Let's try it. And so we kept pushing through, but then after a while, it's like, shoot, like it felt just honestly miserable. And it's like, I think he's happy here. He liked the accommodations, but it's like, even, you know, even if he's enjoying that, like, what is it doing to us? Like, you know, and just, I was almost, I'm, I've always been a very joyous person, but I felt, you know, completely apathetic. Like I just wanted the days to pass because I just didn't want to like live this life. And so more of the breakdowns at first that I was having, it was more so me just feeling these things and not necessarily Jake. But then around that three week point, Jake was like, okay, I've had enough too. Like he was struggling then as well, in addition to me. And so we realized it was unfortunately the best choice. And so we definitely did learn a lot from the process. I do think, um, again, my, my intent here is I'm, I don't want to blame anyone else because the thing is like we made this choice, but it was very interesting when we went through the process then of letting them know. Um, and even just during the time we had him, um, about half the rabbits that that adoption center adopted out all came back. And what was interesting is after we told them, like they knew what our challenges were like with the chewing, with that kind of thing. And in his listing, like the paragraph or paragraphs written about him, they said he did great and he didn't chew and a few other things. And even when we sent him back, they didn't change that at all. They still said he does great. He doesn't chew. And I understand that you, if you want a rabbit to get adopted out or just an animal in general, you don't want to air out all the dirty laundry on the listing, but at least don't lie. At least remove that sentence from the listing. Um, so I, I can't help but feel a little bit like it was sort of false advertising. So I think going into the future, I think for us, it's something that I can't trust. I, sh I shouldn't go in trusting what people are saying, honestly, about any animal. Um, 
no one checked our references. There was no communication like ahead of time about like anything really. It was just like, perfect. You want this rabbit? Come pick him up. And so I know Jake had felt like that was maybe a red flag, but we were just like, well, no, we think this will work. And um, I think that also was a good lesson to learn um, from the process too. It was in the middle of February when he went to the new foster and definitely felt a lot of guilt, but also just trying to think maybe ownership of a rabbit wasn't the right fit for us, but how else can we give back and support rabbits? Um, Because we do really love them as a species. We just think it was more so like the wrong place, wrong time, maybe even not the right rabbit for a fit for us. Um, And even just where we were at in life. So I think once the pain of letting him go heals, uh, we have wanted to get into volunteering um, with rabbits now that we've spent time with one. We do know how to take care of them. So uh, we'd like to do that at some point. Like I said, once a little bit of time has passed and then we did uh, donate $500 to uh, partially to the organization where we adopted him from. But also since this process happened, we realized there was a different rabbit organization that ironically was also closer that seems to be a lot more credible. So we also um, donated to them. So that's kind of how we're moving forward at this point. We're definitely not opposed to um, trying it out again in the future, like in the very distant future. I feel like a rabbit could be a very good like empty nester kind of a pet, especially after going through these other phases of life. Um, And especially once we have, you know, a bigger house where I know some people actually set up like rabbit rooms where the whole room is perfectly bunny proofed. Um, It's really good to have a bonded pair. So multiple rabbits um, there and kind of have that be a little paradise. Um, So that might be a a thing we consider. And I think we would just consider fostering in the future. Um, We didn't realize that you could just say, hey, I don't want to adopt a rabbit, but can I foster this one specifically? Um, So that was something we learned. I just assumed if you put your name on like the foster list, they would give you, you know, whatever rabbit needed a spot, which of course there's validity in that. Um, But I guess you were able to request, hey, I want to, I want to foster this rabbit. I don't want to adopt them, but I'll take them um, off the hands of the previous foster. So definitely a very educational experience. I know (laughs) I've already talked about this a long time, but this definitely contributed to a lot of the stress that was happening both in January and February while we had him, but then also in the transition once we no longer had him and working through those different feelings and resetting the space. All that being said, to get back to Gemma's question about um, moving furniture around and helping the home feel fresh, I know we've done a lot of that uh, since he, um, since Droopy left. And it's definitely, we made a ton of changes prior to his arrival and that life change encouraged us to be ruthless in letting go of certain belongings and i would say also what's good is that we even though we are being pretty ruthless in letting go of a large percentage of of items including several pieces of furniture we had been intentional enough that we don't have regrets now that that is over i think um, i don't necessarily feel the need to consistently change things up I don't really get bored in the space, but I do think it's kind of a very gradual process of gradually evolving the space into something that is a better fit overall. And so one of the things that we've improved the most, I would say, um, is actually some of our storage areas. It's easy for storage areas to sort of be a dumping ground or like that concealed space where you put whatever else needs a home. But we actually recently, reorganize our coat closet and we had these wire grids around everything to bunny proof it and we obviously don't need them for that purpose anymore so we built them into a little grid organizer where we store some shoes and other basic items in the coat closet and it's just been nice to have some of those things tucked away but also there's just less in the coat closet now which is nice Um, So it it does help keep the space much more minimal. And even something small like the inside of one coat closet, I think can feel really good. So with that in mind, not necessarily going through just to go through different spaces, but 
thinking about how can I gradually optimize the space each month or even just make a 1% change. So that's kind of what we've been doing. Our next question comes from Amy and she asked, would you consider reopening the Patreon podcast at a future time? Once you and Jake have solidified your routines, it was such fun being part of that. Also, do you have any travel plans for the upcoming summer? Great questions here. And so I guess as a follow up to uh, the most recent update where we talked about um, letting go of Droopy, we uh, had in December started a private podcast on Patreon and it was a lot of fun. Unfortunately, through the stress and challenge of having Droopy, for me, it was a huge wake up call that um, I've, you know, I've managed a lot of tasks and busyness uh, for a long time, but it was kind of what broke me. And I realized, you know, very seriously, I have to cut things and I need to cut whatever I can. I honestly actually thought of several days, like I'm going to have to delete this channel. I can't keep doing this and living this way. I did not, we're, we're still here. Um, but I was very much in crisis mode um, during this time. And um, so for me, it was a very big turning point in realizing like I hadn't, you know, in all this time, like I'd be working 70 hour weeks when I was teaching and running businesses and it never broke me until um, having this rabbit broke me. Um, so we don't have the rabbit anymore, but it was a very eye opening thing. And I realized I am just spread so thin that, you know, one large lifestyle change, albeit, but one lifestyle change brought everything crumbling down. So I think, although I did love doing that, even though it was a very short lived two month um, endeavor, I realized that I can't, I am already spread too thin. If any changes are happening, I need to cut things rather than adding things. So unfortunately, um, I don't think I'll be bringing that back, uh, but I did have a ton of fun. And it was, it was a great little community there for a couple months and uh, it's possible that we'll see more of Jake on this channel if he's interested and, and as we continue to see how the channel evolves, but that's in the short term, unfortunately not uh, going to happen. As far as travel plans, um, nothing is confirmed yet. I know I always have the travel bug, <laughs> especially um, as I mentioned earlier, watching shows like The Amazing Race where they're traveling all around, it definitely gets me excited seeing the different locations, but also trying to still navigate it within the pandemic and within other, you know, different things that are happening. Um, my hope is that we will travel in the summer, um, specifically like May or June, uh, maybe more so early summer, but um, it is up in the air. I think definitely something for me that has changed about um, travel during like the pandemic and, and whatnot is, um, I'm more so planning things last minute than I was in the past. I wouldn't say completely last minute, but uh, Jake and I traveled for two months in the fall in um, a little bit of September, October, and November, a large percentage of November. And I actually booked most of the trip like two weeks before we left. Um, September was really, September like 10th, was when we had a big like back to school payout from the teacher store um, until we left. Like those two weeks, I was really booking 90% of it. And so the perk of that was, you know, kind of waiting last minute. I kind of could tell where things were at um, in the world and, and whatnot. So I think definitely, um, whereas before I might plan something months in advance, now it's definitely much more impromptu and spontaneous. So. N nothing yet, but I'm sure uh, I'll share when, when something does come from that. Next question came from Lisa and she said, I'd like to know how you like to travel the most and what types of holidays the two of you enjoy as there's always the environmental factor to balance out with enjoying life and treating oneself. And this is a great question or series of questions. Um, I would say with travel, I do, I think it, they're kind of maybe two different extremes but I do love road trips. I've, I've come to thoroughly enjoy them. I love the process of being able to not only get to whatever the destination is, but to see everything along the way. And it gives me a lot of satisfaction to think, okay, here's the map. 
I mean, I'm a big geography nerd, so it makes sense. But I love to just look and see all the places along the way. And maybe it's an irritation of Jake's, but uh, I can't just like go to a destination and come home because how many cool places are just right there or slightly off the path? And so then these turn into a two month trip or something crazy. Um, but I think definitely road trips I love, but then I also love, and this is especially international, being able to, I guess, I, I don't know if it would technically be considered backpacking because we're not doing some of the traditional backpacker things and we don't really have that big of backpack. I mean, they still are backpacks. Anyway, I digress. Um, being able to just be very spontaneous and um, going, you know, from place to place, public transportation, visiting all the, you know, cool museums or historical sites um, overseas. So we've really enjoyed that. Now, our last international trip was in 2018. So it's been a while. Um, but I would say I really love both styles of travel. I'm not really the kind of person who wants to stay in one place for too long. Um, so I'm not like the type really to go to one destination, stay there for 10 days and come home or for seven days, however long. Um, so we kind of mix it up. But yeah, it just kind of depends on the place, I suppose. And I'm sure this travel style will change a lot in the future when we have kids. And so I think that's also part of where we're, where our head is at right now. We know we won't be able to travel this exact same way in the future with kids. So it's trying to maximize that when we've had the opportunity. So that's kind of our travel style, I would say. And then in terms of the holidays, I'm really not much of a holiday person, which I know I've said, you know, multiple times on the channel, but I think that's because I feel like every day can be significant or any day can be special. In a way, I think expectations can be the thief of joy because if someone is expecting XYZ is going to happen on a certain holiday or for any situation and it doesn't happen, you're left disappointed rather than being excited and grateful for what ended up happening even if you didn't expect it at all so for me we don't really do much for holidays i mean my favorite holiday is earth day so that's coming up um but there's not necessarily that's not one people celebrate really so as far as you know special simple pleasures in day-to-day -day life and, and maybe even just when we are doing a trip i am very supportive of you know not depriving oneself of some of the different joys even if not everything is perfectly environmental obviously traveling for instance is more wasteful than not doing anything and just you know living your normal life but i think it's also important not to look at the extremes an extreme perspective might say look you can never travel because it's bad for the environment or do x y and z but that's not very much a balanced life i think ultimately it comes from defining balance and figuring out what that balance looks like and also something that I've reflected a lot about, um, I would say in the last year especially, is how many different impacts there are, or ways to impact different things. There's so many different causes that any of us can be working towards at any given point. And sometimes we're focusing our energy on one specific cause rather than another cause instead. And, or vice versa, someone's working on another cause, but then hurting this other cause and it's tricky. So for instance, you know, we've talked a lot about pets. Many people are animal advocates and do a lot of work with animals, but not necessarily caring about sustainability or other factors. Others are maybe more focusing more on human rights um, protections and supporting people that way. And they're not necessarily concerned about the environment directly. There's so many different causes we can focus on and it's tough. We can't really focus on all of them equally. So I think it's just about doing the best we can in our own position in life and with the resources we have available. So that's maybe not very helpful of an answer, but generally uh, my, my current thoughts on it. I also think it goes into seasons of life and in our certain situation, like I mentioned, Jake and I are in a unique place where we have more opportunity and flexibility at this current moment. So we can travel now, but we realize that when we have kids, we're going to be much more, you know, stable and in one place. Um, so we won't be able to do some of these things, but there's other trade-offs we'll be able to do as well at that time, such as 
get into more gardening. I think goal, Sarah, once I have a house and a yard, would be to grow more of my own food. I think that's super cool. And we haven't had the chance to do so, partially because of where we have lived, but also because we've often been traveling during the summer and gone for extended periods of time. So yeah, it's all a trade-off. <laughs> that answer was a bit of a mess. Last question today comes from Kathy, and she said, now that Jake and you both work from home, how do you juggle and separate your work from your home life? Also, because you are a night person and he's a morning person, when do you two find things to do together or find time to do things together? So I think this, this is very much an interesting question because we have definitely, our schedule has already been evolving um, during this time. Uh, Jake started working with me full time in, I guess technically June of 2021 after his school year was done. But I would ironically say, I think more of the reason he was a morning person was actually because of teaching. And like, you know, when you're a teacher, you kind of have to be, or else you're going to end up majorly sleep deprived like myself <laughs> when I was in the classroom. Uh, so he's actually shifted to more of a night owl schedule. Um, our current sort of schedule, um, since we've been at home and consistently working, um, would be more so like he'll wake up around nine, I'll wake up around 10 in the morning. And uh, we usually have a very leisurely morning, so we probably won't get into much work until around noon. And then we'll work um, for the afternoon, take a break for some going to the gym or going for a walk if it's nicer weather. And then we'll do more work in the evening. And then I'll usually stay up a couple hours extra just because I have boundless energy <laughs> and a lot of, of, of passion and joy in the work. Um, so I go to bed around, I want to say 2 a.m., but realistically it's been three to four recently still. So, you know, we, have, we still have ways to improve. Um, so we really do get to spend most of our day together, uh, which is, which is very cool. And he'll, I think, usually go to bed between midnight and two. It really just depends. Um, so that's kind of the general, uh, general schedule there. I think, uh, for him, he when we, we've talked about it, he likes the idea of being more of a morning person. But I also think some of it comes into, you know, we can have certain goals for a long time, but it's not necessarily bad to do something different. Like if overall quality of life is there, you know, if you're, it's not necessarily bad to not be a morning person if that's just not your schedule and, you know, you're able to prioritize enough sleep and, and that sort of thing. So I think it's all kind of just the trade-offs of life again. As far as uh, work versus home life, it's definitely tricky to find the balance. And I think that's just because of, it's truly such a unique position that we're in where with our work, it is a passive income-based business. So how it works is essentially we create a bunch of different resources for teachers specifically. So we do their lesson planning for them. We create slideshows they can present to their students. We create activities. We create reading passages. We do basically anything a teacher would need. We create tests. We have full units. And we actually have, uh, at this point, like full year curriculum. So a teacher can purchase the curriculum and not have to plan the entire school year um, if they want to use all the resources. Um, but when you create something, for this, we don't make any money. It's, it's just the effort of, you know, thinking that this is a need a teacher will have, we're gonna make it. But then, you know, in the future, once that product is done and ready to sell, um, it's in our store and it will sell, you know, periodically throughout the year, some cases daily, it just depends upon the resource. And so it's a very interesting thing because our income is not tied to how much we work in a certain day. A lot of it's like that past work that has paid off, but we're still trying to add more resources and we get multiple requests every week. Hey, can you make this or can you make this for us? So it's definitely kind of a unique perspective. So we don't have a strong sense of this is work time, this is home time and just hanging out. And also I'll be fully transparent. I don't really practice many hobbies that aren't work related at this time um, that aren't like physical activity. So that's definitely something that, you know, I think ideally uh, can change later. But I also, you know, if it, since it brings me a lot of joy, I don't necessarily think it's, it's a problem at this point. So 
the answer, I guess, is just that it's complicated and we don't have clear set boundaries. But I think that's also because with the work, like for instance, while we were doing our two month trip, I mean, I was working every day on the trip, but for some days I was only working a half hour. Um, other days, like maybe if it was bad weather or something fell through, maybe I'd work a couple hours. Um, we didn't create that many products while we were on the trip, but it just kind of, kind of flexible. So it ebbs and flows. Um, so it's definitely a, like I said, it's a very unique position. I'm still working about 50 hours a week, which is a lot better than where I was before at like 60 or 70 hours even. But yes, it just, it's very flexible. So I've just been so wordy in today's video, but uh, thank you for sticking around and I hope you enjoyed the Q and A. We will be back to more traditional content. I'm excited to share about some of the videos that will be coming up. We have a couple different room tour videos coming up as well as a list of some other fun ones. In the meantime, feel free to check out some of these past videos or you can subscribe to the channel right up here and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.